Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Leadership on a fairly grey Friday afternoon in the United Kingdom. But joining us this week, it's great, some new faces. So first of all, Sharon McDowell Larson, uh, who's a colleague of ours and uh, is calling from the western slopes of the Rocky Mountains. So a mixture of desert and snow. So she's got the best of both worlds. Hi, Sharon. And Dina uh, Matesi is joining us from the University of Wisconsin, Stewart's Point. So she's further north in the United States, uh, but it's lovely to see both of them. And then Phil Donaldson, who's actually much nearer to home. So Phil's in the Lake District. And uh, we're gonna be talking this afternoon about a whole range of things, but mainly to do with energy, particularly maintaining our energy, uh, exercise, having fun doing exercise. Sharon and, and Lena are both going to be sharing bits of information and research they've got. Phil's going to be chipping in because he's a psychologist and also a sports person, so uh, has worked closely with Sharon. Um, and so, and the rest of us are just going to try and sort of contribute where we can. If you've got any questions, any challenges, anything you want to say, then we'll pick it up on the chat which is live and we'll do our best to incorporate any of your comments into our conversations. Uh, and uh, challenge us, say anything you like, but remember this is live. So uh, we're not gonna do any editing. Anyway, it's great to see you all. Um, I'm gonna kick off if I may, by just asking you Lena to share just some of the things that are happening in your neck of the woods when it comes to the students you work with and look after and some of the thoughts going through their minds at the moment. Thank you so much. Well, at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, we're what we refer to in the US as a teaching university. We specialize in attracting people from our regional area, so we're a regional comprehensive. And so the folks that we have, we're situated in about the center of the state. And the folks, most of the folks that we have are coming from 35 to 60 miles away from our three campus locations in Stevens Point, Marshfield, and, uh, and Wausau. Uh, these are folks that are working while they're paying their tuition, maybe one, two, three jobs. Many of these folks are first time college students. And what I find interesting, Sharon, I, I would love to hear a definition of energy from you, actually from all of you, because I think energy is an interesting word. What I find is that these folks are um, both suffering and optimistic at the same time. You know, they're suffering under the weight of the legacy systems, if you will, of education, uh, of work, of the marketplace, the workplace, of uh, the um, what it means to be human, right? Of what the financial system is. They feel the weight of that, and they still want the benefits of all those legacy systems. At, but Matthew. The part, this is where the suffering comes in, is they want to make all new systems at the same exact time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, that, so, so that they're, they're in a pretty difficult, challenging place, a lot of them, yeah, mm -hmm. for all sorts of reasons. So how about this energy piece then? So you've thrown the challenge out to us, Dina. So how are, we going to, how are we going to define energy? So I suppose we ought to go to Phil and to Sharon first of all. Go on, Sharon, have a go at it from your perspective. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, at the basis of good energy is, uh, you know, foundation to that is getting good sleep. Mm -hmm. And so what we find is that, you know, throughout the day, as we use our brains, um, we build up something called adenosine within the brain. And as that builds up within the brain, that is then makes us more tired and sleepy and have less motivation and less energy to do things that take effort. So we all experience this in terms of, you know, early in the day, you're, 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 you're ready to go at it. By the time you get to the evening, you just want to lie on the couch and just veg in front of the television. Um, and so sleep is one of the best things that you can do to restore those, to, to reduce those levels of adenosine within the brain. Um, and, you know, you can, you can get by with, with a little sleep for a short period of time, but sooner or later, that's going to that's gonna catch up to you. Um, and then, of course, the other piece of it is what is what we feed ourselves with. I mean, that's critically important in terms of the substrates that we use to 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 get energy. And if we're filling up our diets with with junk food and lots of you know fat heavy you know animal foods and things like that, then that's just going to bog us down as well. And so that that actually slows blood flow to the brain. Um, it slows blood flow to other parts of the body, and 
uh, inhibits our ability to take up oxygen. So, so uh, you know, I, I would say that those two pieces are the, are the are keys in terms of maintaining energy. Yeah. But, and, and I'm showing my age now, but A, it sounds quite fun to slope around on the couch late at night, sort of, <laughs> sort of dribbling and whatever. But I mean, my, my remembrance of student life was very little sleep and an awful lot of fast food or sort of inappropriate food. So how does that, that must put the students that you've been talking about, Lena, in a, assuming some of them are, are perhaps sleep short and, and food quick, that, um, that might put them in an even worse situation. Well, we talked about, I mean, who used this term lockdown burnout? Who used that? Well, that was Britt. That was, oh, Britt, this beautiful term. I want you to tell us more about this because I don't know about you, but I'm, my students and I are, are increasing our suffering by acting exactly opposite of what Sharon's saying, right? I, I have a hard time sleeping and I'm eating all the wrong foods because I'm, I'm getting that instant, that instant gratification. Britt, how does this relate to lockdown burnout? <laughs> That, well, that's that's really interesting that you mention it because, um, as I mentioned before, before we started recording, there was an article in the in the one of the UK newspapers today talking about lockdown burnout, which is the finding by many psychologists and and, and other mental health workers in in the UK that the now that we're in the second or even third wave with this new variant, people find that they cope less well. Uh, they coped during the first wave because it was kind of new and we all expected that it would end soon. And it was in a way for some people, well, almost, I wouldn't say exciting, but it was new and it was, hey, come on, we're going to get through this. And now we don't know, although there are vaccines, we just don't know where it's going yet. So people's energy, I guess, uh, and uh, patience uh, is wearing thin, people are anxious. And so this is what's called lockdown burnout. And the interesting thing that you mentioned, uh, Nina, is that we all know what's best for us and all the things that, that Sharon, that you are making, all the points you're making make absolute sense. And, and it made me realize straight away that I'm not eating very healthily this evening, I won't be. Um, but at the same time, the article to your point, Lena, said, be kind to yourself. So yes, there's lockdown burnout. So yes, you have to pay attention to your physical health. You have to get out, you have to walk in nature. And at the same time, don't beat yourself up. So if you do go for that bar of chocolate, maybe not every two hours, but if you do, be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up. So yeah. Phil, how do you cope? And um, so I, just building on that, Britt, yeah, yeah. I find it fascinating because lockdown burnout is one thing, but my conversations throughout the past year with different leaders have been almost on the same subject in a different context which is we're still talking about how do I get enough sleep? How do I eat the right things? How do I get some exercise? But instead of being, how do I get enough sleep when I'm traveling all of the time and in different time zones? Now it's, how do I get enough sleep when I'm stuck at home and working in my back bedroom? And um, how do I, well, you said there, how do I make sure my diet's okay? Not because I eat in a disastrous way when I'm stuck to my desk in the office, but I eat in a disastrous, different, but still disastrous way when I'm trapped at home and the kitchen is but three steps away behind me. <laughs> and um, and it, it is interesting because people are coming up with solutions to this, but they're different solutions this time. And so the, uh, the, 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 my latest one, the talking to somebody last week, was that he now walks the dog in the morning instead of commuting in the car for half an hour. Yeah. And um, so whereas previously we were talking about, well, how do I build my exercise when I'm commuting in the car and then I'm 10 hours in the office? Um, now it's how do I force myself out with the dog? Because this is something that I know is a good habit is exercise. I mean, it's activity, um, but it's just a different set of solutions that are, people are finding. And I think I think we read the same article, Britt. I think it's the these solutions are the same in a different context yeah. and looking to address the same things. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's to add to that, um, just in some of the clients that I've worked with, you know, one of the questions we ask is, so are you doing better from a lifestyle habits, healthy habits perspective than now than you were before? Or are you doing worse? And about 50% say, well, I'm actually doing better. And to your point, Phil, they're using their commute time to to use that as exercise time. They're using uh, the opportunity, they're not eating out in restaurants and so they're cooking at home. 
they're growing gardens and eating more vegetables, but then you have the 50% that say, um, yeah, you know, I, I now feel like I have to work 24 seven. And so they're sort of getting up at 6 a.m. And, and not giving them the permission, themselves permission to, or, or staking out time in the day to get out and get some exercise. And so, so I, I think you're absolutely right in, in terms of we're seeing um, you know, unique solutions that people are coming up with, but at the same time, other people are struggling. <laughs> and, and I also think that <clears throat> it, it has aggravated or exposed is probably a better word the enormous difference between the haves and the have nots. So, you know, we've just talked about walking the dog, we've talked about cooking food, growing vegetables in our garden and whatever. Um, you know, I'm privileged, I live in the countryside, I have a garden, I've got a dog, I can do all of those things. If you're 15 floors up in a tower block in the middle of a city and the nearest park is, you know, a mile away and it's snow on the ground and you haven't got a garden, then, and you're a student or you're a young person because they're an enormous, I mean, and certainly in the UK, the students in the UK have been, they won't be the hardest done by, but they've been hit hard because they're paying all their rent out, but they're not able to use their, their facilities. They're mm -hmm. supposed to have face-to-face -face tutorials, but they're getting Zoom calls like this. You know, so there's a, it exposed an enormous raft of people who, however much we talk about, sort of we could do this and we can do that, actually can't. Or, or are are less able to. It's not as it's not immediately obvious. And I think that's that must be incredibly tough because a lot of what we talk about is making the assumption that we do actually we can actually do this stuff. And for a lot of people, that's not always possible. Certainly, the, certainly the young. Anyway, I think. Um, and then you get the young complaining that you know they've got it tough and it's awful and they can't do this and they can't do that. And then the older generation say, well, you didn't live through the Second World War, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and, and so that sort of, that goes round like a wheel with the hamster in the middle of it all the time. But, I mean, you know what I hear young people saying that um, is, I think, devastating, or as Phil would say, disastrous for them, is this feeling that their time is being stolen, right? Yeah. This is their time. Yeah. We've already had our time. That's the have and have nots, right? And so <laughs> I think that's pretty accurate, right? This is so we have people who are graduating. This is when I was supposed to get that great job. And now I can't, I can't even find a job, right? This is when I was supposed to move to that city, but they rescinded that job offer because they've pulled back on their workforce. Yeah. So how do we cope? How do we help? younger people cope with this rather than just sit there looking rather smug because we we you know we're not in the same situation or we have got the resources we can do stuff how do we actually help them through it i wish it was that easy matthew i mean the um one of the things maybe is that if, we, if we think about energy I, I love the conversation about energy and where it comes from if we think on a given day we get a finite amount of energy to use maybe what we can do is just help people consider how they um use that energy in the day and um, I've decided not to watch the news quite so much because you can become addicted to, to news because you're fascinated about what's going on but it's not particularly healthy or helpful um, so maybe directing that to some greater purpose have a purpose beyond yourself and your immediate vicinity to do something else I mean we've been inspired by many people around the world who have chosen to do that and talk about fitness um, there are people who go online and, and, and or maybe you know, come up on the news to go and help people in, in big communities and kids as well, whilst they're being homeschooled to um, to be active and bring that playground into the home as well. So how you spend your energy, assuming you have some of it, could be another thing that we could um, focus on a bit more and, and, and choosing to be positive about that, because it's where a lot of frustration, you know, people fighting um, and pushing back against these rules and the freedom and the, and the social uh, liberties that have been somewhat restricting for people particularly the young people who are struggling to, um, I mean, my, my kids would never use the phone as a phone. Is that true? Have you had the same experience? You know, all the social media mechanisms, but never actually as a phone. Um, mm. and, and because they were having social gatherings, they didn't need to. But now, of course, um, with Zoom, like, like we're on right now, and then and mechanisms like that, it's not the same as being together with your peers. Um, but figuring out ways to actually somehow connect and have that relationship, um, I think is important. And um, but I, I really you know, connect to the fact that, that the time is ticking. So how do we get that energy which we have directed in the right things? It's not easy. 
it isn't. I like that idea of the finite amount of energy and also the the link between energy, I mean positive energy, because mm -hmm. we talked last week we talked about negative energy, the angry voice. You know, there's a lot of energy in anger, but that's not the kind of energy that helps us right now. Yeah. So it's about positive focused attention and the choice of where you allocate that on a daily basis, whether it's on to something really small or something a bit more meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, Sharon, I, I wanted to ask you, because just as Ian and, and both Ian and Britt were talking, I was thinking, I can go out and take some exercise, some physical exercise, and I, I'm, I know some of us in this group take a lot of physical exercise, but, you know, I can go out for a run and come, and, and so my physical energy is drained, but my mental energy or my, my thought processes are energised. So just at the moment, I seem to, I'd, I'd like to know what the chemistry is that you turn your physical energy into mental energy. And then when you exhaust your mental energy, it's time, well, maybe it's too late, but it's time to get out and do something physical. So what is the connection between those two things? Well, I don't know if you want to speak up, Phil, but um, I think there's a number of mechanisms that, that help with that. And one is just increased blood flow. And so anytime you can increase blood flow to the brain, you're going to see an uptick in, in cognitive function and performance. And, you know, one of the sayings, like I, I like to tell people is that exercise improves cognitive function in just about every way that we can measure cognitive function, uh, including creativity in, in particular. Uh, so, um, so that's one mechanism. So you have increased blood flow, you have increased nutrient delivery, and you have increased oxygen delivery as well. And the brain is very, uh, very selfish in, in use of, of, of those uh, resources. So it, it, it really demands a lot of, of energy and, and oxygen. Um, the other is over time, you see an increase in something called brain derived neurotropic factor, which um, is anabolic to the brain. And so that helps to, to increase our, you know, it helps protect, ex protect existing neurons and as well as grow new neurons as well. Um, I think there's a meditative um, component as well. So if you think about just running or walking, um, you're actually using both sides of the brain in order to accomplish that. And so there's a meditative as aspect to that as well. And we all know the benefits of, of meditation as, uh, to brain function as well. But there is a little bit of a double-edged sword, Matthew, in the sense that if you, if you do extreme exercise, like if you go for a 20 mile run, um, sometimes that can really increase that adenosine in the brain that I talked about, about and then have the opposite effect where you just sort of mentally and physically exhausted. <laughs> so you kind of have to find, get the right balance between the right amount and not too much. And that's probably gonna be different for different people. Yeah. And if I can uh, put a word in here for the, the idea of exercise as movement, uh, which I know is strange coming from somebody who enjoys sports, but uh, there's, a, there's an element of this uh, coronavirus sort of life that we have, which is that our movement has decreased. And you get a lot of the benefits of the increased blood flow just from moving more. Yep. I think there's a book called Eat, Sleep, Move. And, and it's yep. a good phrase to remember because yep. I think that on the days when I'm moving more, I'm probably increasing my blood flow more than on the days when I go out for a 30 minute run spend the rest of the day sat at my desk yeah. and so yeah, there's, there's sorry go ahead. That, well it's just uh, that's the challenge to lockdown and I do think the, the word lockdown doesn't help us either because it's it's uh, one way of thinking at the moment we're locked down and soon we'll be unlocked and we'll be able to move more when we get back to normal but there's <laughs> something different around the corner a, a different mix, a different blend of how we'll work and therefore how much opportunity we'll have to move. And uh, so I think it's it's kind of a, a word out for just fidgeting, moving more, uh, walking around, as well as building in some exercise if you have the opportunity. Yeah, that's, I, that's a great point. There's a, there's a term we call the active couch potato. And, yeah. and the active couch potato is where you go up and do your morning run and then sit the rest of the day. and. And that actually isn't that benefit. It's beneficial, but not as beneficial as, as having consistent movement throughout the day. Yeah. 
I really do think potatoes get a bad rap in all of this. You know, why can't it be a couch carrot or couch <laughs> cabbage or something? But because they because they carved as well, Matthew. They get it in both directions. Okay. <laughs> but I I actually uh, you know I also heard the other day um, uh, an optician making a very very sensible comment. And he he in fact he he said it to my wife. She was having her eyes tested. He said, "You've got to remember the twenty 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 rule." And she said, well, what does that mean? And, she, and he said, every 20 minutes, stare 20 feet away from you for 20 seconds. And that, mm -hmm. that helps you um, to exercise your eye muscles mm -hmm. so that you don't get eye fatigue. And I'd never heard of that before, but I've started doing it. And boy, does it make a difference. But it, it's 20 minutes, 20 seconds, 20 feet, or whatever the metric equivalent is. You know? And... Um, I think that this this idea of movement, Phil, is a. It sounds like a really important one. That that just getting up and moving to another room, going out into the garden for a few minutes of fresh air, just doing something, sitting from your chair, sounds really really important. And and this uh, the article that you mentioned, Britt, um, it, it, amongst other things, it just refers to uh, lockdown stress. And the fact that we have well-established stress management techniques um, and uh, deploying those in this situation and the power that those can have. And these stress management techniques are, as, as they're not just psychological, they are what we're talking about, which is get enough sleep, eat well, and uh, move more. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, I mean, going back to your point, Matthew, about um, students and people in their early careers, um, they're the in danger of missing out so much in terms of the amount of movement and the opportunity that uh, the people have for movement within that because there's a there's an element of uh, working hours sat uh, studying or applying for jobs or searching online which is going to be a very sedentary activity and uh, and a big hamper the opposite of what we know are well-established ways of managing stress or, or managing pressure to avoid it becoming stressful. Yeah. I love this so much. So I, I, Matthew, with your permission, I'd like to tie together something. I think we probably yeah. all teach. <laughs> go, go for it, Lena, go on. How about the walking meeting? So I, this is what Phil and Ian, well, this is what all of us are talking about. And I think it gets to Matthew's question. So I've been doing this. I've been inviting people to take walks with me. I've got a bookings site. People can schedule one, 20 minute one-on-ones with me directly. And uh, we go outside and walk. Now, last night there was you know four and a half feet of snow. So we're not walking today. <laughs> But, but most days, um, getting outside, being a safe distance, we're doing what Ian was talking about with the connection. That connection matters, right? Uh, less isolation. But we're also, Phil talked about this really interesting thing that, that relates back to a word that we used before, that being outside, there's something special about that. There's an awe. I think that was the word Sharon used. Phil used this word disastrous. And um, uh, so... There's a, uh, I don't know if you know this, but if you look at the etymology of disaster, it's about being sep one way that we can define that, look at the, the meaning of that word is about being separated from the stars. And so we can do a lot by getting outside, right? We're engaging all, we're engaging connection, we're engaging what Phil is advocating for, for movement. And so if you're a young leader listening to this, invite other people to walk with you get outside and, and Sharon, how much time do we need to do it? What's our minimum time for uh, impact? <laughs> yeah, I mean, minimum time is about 20 or 30 minutes a day. So, um, pre, you know, and you can spread that out over the course of a day, but that's pretty, you know, pretty achievable, I think. Um, but it is somewhat dose dependent, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm fairly sure I've seen a phenomenon which building on what you were saying there, Lynn, which must be called the walking virtual meeting, which is where people are in different parts of the world, but having a conversation with each other while they're both outside. I've done that too. <laughs> I had a, a, an executive coaching engagement. They were in one state and I was in another and that's how we did it. Yeah, I, and, and it's, I know of companies who now do this um, in terms of the team meetings they have, 
that they've so I know one company where they have cameras on their heads you know they have virtual they have cameras and they they walk around talking about things that people can experience what they're so they get the movement they get the they get the uh, the the energy if you like from the person moving around but they also feel that they're on that walk with them um and I know we've tried I tried recently filming my garden live time with the birds and then trying to have a sort of reflection period with a couple of colleagues while I just showed the film for about five minutes trying to imagine you know well we, we all know that you know sitting on hillsides and mountain tops and Brit you with all the walks that you do there are those moments when you just find you're in a different place there's that awe or that moment to think so I thought well could I do that by showing a film of me sitting not me sitting in the garden but as if I'm sitting in the garden just listening to the birds um it, it works to a point yeah it, it does you you can you can create that that special moment but actually walking out with your mobile phone or film or whatever and and doing that is just one step further I think we, you know, everyone should be doing that yeah. as long as they're going with someone or or if, like you were saying Lena if you can actually pair up um, I, again, there's a, there's a client in Ireland where one person there on a program recently said, yeah, I rang up my colleague. We live about a mile apart from each other. We met, we walked, we had a meeting. You know, we kept two meters apart because that's the social distancing requirement. And we had a perfectly good conversation, got a whole lot of stuff done, and we had exercise at the same time, you know. Yeah, yeah. I just love the thought, Britt, of Matthew with a selfie stick just walking down the street. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that, that's a step too far, Ian. That is a step too far. <laughs> Excellent. And that, bring, that brings up a great point, Matthew. Um, you know, they've, they, there's this idea of biophilic environments. So biophilic environments are where you bring nature into the workplace. And so a lot of companies are doing this. And so even just having potted plants in your office, um, having pictures, looking at pictures of nature um, can have some sort of restorative value as well in terms of brain function. Um, and so if you don't have access to, to natural environments, then trying to bring them inside um, can be helpful as well. Yeah. And Britt, you're a great walker. So what are, you know, because you, you've walked miles since you've been living in the UK. So what do you find about that aspect of, of activity that's helpful? I, I very much relate to the word awe when I'm out. I do, I do. And it's, it's kind of soothing because you pass places and you see trees and you see landscapes and you think yeah we're tiny and it will be okay somehow i find it soothing yeah. uh, whatever we're doing to the climate which is a completely different chapter but i do find it soothing and what i like most and that relates to something that i would like sharon to say a little bit more about i find when i'm out walking with my walking buddies uh we always have fun we always have we get the giggles and we tease each other and it's always an element of of laughter and of joy. And I hear myself laughing more when I'm outside with them. And I'm pretty sure that that makes it even better to be walking. And that relates to something you said, Sharon. You said when you have fun, it's even more beneficial. Can you say yes. a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so uh, this, this was actually, a, part, part of the research was on animals, uh, where they looked at, uh, where they did them, had them force them to do exercise on a, on a running wheel or something like that. But then they also had them do kind of more, um, you know, their self-regulated uh, exercise by themselves, you know, where they, where they, um, where, where it was their choice, and, and basically found that the benefits are greater when it, when they chose to do it as opposed to being forced to do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think exercising with friends just checks so many boxes for people because particularly if you enjoy their company, right? Um, so the time goes by much more quickly, the, you know, that, that social engagement, um, you know, and from a brain perspective, um, when you're engaging with other people on multiple levels, and so when you're with people, you sort of gauge in their reactions, you, you're carrying on conversations, um, you know, it has this, this, this benefit to the brain that is it above and beyond just getting out and, and moving. Um, and that's, you know, they talk about sort of uh, brain games. But when you do brain games with other people, that heightens the complexity of what you're doing and is even better for the brain than just being on a computer playing, a, playing some sort of brain game, if that, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's brilliant, yeah. And music too can help oh, in yeah. terms of 
enhancing the enjoyment as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I have a piano in the next room. Not that I can play it very well, but I find just, if, particularly if I've been on Zoom call after Zoom call, like I have been today, just sitting next door and playing a few scales or trying to play a little bit of music that I perhaps can't play, but just trying to sort of focus on something else. The movement from one room to the other, you know, it's only a few minutes. Yes, I'm lucky enough to have a little piano, but it, 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 boy, does it make a difference on occasions, particularly if you've been really intensively focused on something for quite a long yeah. morning. Yeah. Is it, is it also true that if you just think about where we spend our time and go back to the energy piece again, so you choose, Matthew, to, to, to have a time out and do some music, break your walking, whatever we choose to do, you know, is the idea of hobbies um, not so cool, maybe, in, in, in young people's language? But of course, having something to do which can be done at home or can be done virtually and actually having a purpose outside of your work, your studies, your social interactions, which you can't do as much of, having a project, maybe, things like that. Um, that must be another great thing to really immerse yourself completely in, whether it's learning a language, whether it's learning to play a musical instrument or, or doing puzzles or, or whatever. There's lots of research right around the fact that having something that's totally unrelated maybe so it breaks the monotony of your of your, of your normal day yeah. but also gives you um yeah great intense pleasure if you like so lena yeah. you've been doing that haven't you you were saying before we started this conversation you've taken up a whole lot of new new activities yeah <laughs> of course <laughs> ian i have matthew i have it's been a blast and a, a really challenging blast um and it comes to something i was thinking of so i i hear us talking about health of the mind health of the body health of the heart right and gosh, Ian, isn't it hard sometimes to ask for help in this space? Yeah. For me, learning, often we're reaching out to experts. And, and, and by doing that, you're, you're maybe, you know, not particularly satisfied with your own performance and you may you think may fail. And then you see, you know, yeah, it can be a real put off in terms of um, having the courage to give something a go. Yeah. 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 So we have people, all of us probably do some executive coaching. We have professionals who reach out to us in this space. So I decided to reach out to a professional, William Kepke, uh, uh, on Instagram, I think as probably uh, the Bill Kepke or William Kepke, if you want to track him, he's a very special and unusual man in the best possible way. And I hired him over a year ago to help me. And I thought that I was, I had some health problems. Um, and this was right before COVID hit. And I thought that I would, you know, do what the doctors told me to do. I would, you know, have some very measurable health outcomes. And um, I went into the gym and, you know, I'm a project manager and a leader of leaders. So I had my list and uh, was, Bill had me doing some, some movements to diagnose my range of movement, range of motion. And I was giving him my list and he was very quiet. And, uh, you know, I you know, told him how much weight I had to lose and how much capacity I had to build in these other areas and very silent even. He held the silence and he said, so what about strong? And I swooned. Who says that to women? Right. Who says let's how about if you just work on being strong? I literally swoon and I've been swimming ever since. And but this guy has a really interesting strategy. Um, I was telling you about this hashtag earlier. So hashtag out, O-U-T, W-I for Wisconsin. So out we, and then go. So hashtag out we go. And he's training me in a gym, right? So I'm doing deadlifts and I'm pushing sleds. And it's, it's something I never imagined myself doing, but boy, it lets me, I connect with my students, right? So much. And I do use a swear word in the classroom. I'm a bad, and then you can fill in the next three letters. And they agree with me that I'm a bad. And um, so it gives me a point of connection with my students, but this guy's got me in the gym doing things, Ian, learning things that I never imagined I would learn, but then he's got me kayaking and I've got snowshoes on order and, and kayaking is hilarious. I'm a, you can't tell here, but I'm a bigger girl, bigger woman and getting in and out of that kayak, pure humiliation folks. Just, I mean, that's where the learning is. I'm, Sharon said before that excitement can come from positive or negative things. <laughs> I'm very excited when I'm getting out of that, that kayak, Sharon. And, and he's even got me hunting now. So I've gone pheasant hunting and I'm gonna, I, I, me with a gun, I, I can't even do the dishes without breaking the glass. So 
so thank you for asking me about my adventure. So here's how I would break that down into what Ian's saying, learn. Yeah, learn because it brings difference and excitement to your life. And don't be afraid to, to invite a coach into your life, whether it's somebody that you're paying or not paying. I'll just say one more thing about my coach that I adore. 31 year old guy. I feel like he's 12,000 years old. I've told him this before. He's a very, very, very old soul, ancient soul. And he's always learning new things every single day. And he's got all these. So he's learning how to tan hides from a Native American leader. He's learning how to, he's been, he and his partner have been working on revising this boat, uh, the duck boat. They've been working on it for a year. He's been learning woodworking. And um, so if you go look at his Instagram, he's got these stories up there. He's got a, a dog, Django, who he's been training to hunt. So leaders, young leaders, surround yourself with one, two, three, four, five people who stimulate you and who you can learn something new from and go on walks with them. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. What do you all Great. think of that? <laughs> Wonderful. Great. So what have you been learning, Phil? Oh, I I think um, I mean the, the the thing you said there, Linda, is the the uh, doing the adventure, because I think with so many of these things we can turn them into another task. Um, you can put something on your wrist and say, right, I'm going to walk ten thousand steps a day, um, uh, and you can you can look at your nutrition and start to uh, divide it all down and and go in the different direction completely to start looking at your weight, which is kind of missing the point with energy because i know sharon you and i have talked a lot about energy in terms of nutrition and nutrition in terms of quality of food whereas people do get a bit obsessed with quantity of food and it all becomes measurable and it all becomes not the adventure but it's kind of a means to an end with all of this and uh, and then even worse we become efficient at which point we move less and fit our exercise into a 20 minute run when uh, I'm gonna achieve all of my exercise aim in 20 minutes for the day, which we know in blood flow terms doesn't help us as much. And so a lot of the things that I've learned to answer your question, Matthew, is doing things for the joy of doing them, doing them for their own sake. Um, I, I'm not for the first time in a long time training for a marathon. Um, and it is glorious running for its own sake because we were, Ian, you were telling us about running earlier on. And there's definitely a difference between running to follow a schedule with something on your wrist that tells you how fast you're going and running to enjoy the sights and sounds that are around you. And I think a lot of that helps with, uh, with these things becoming more meaningful, which is definitely the element of avoiding stress that we've not talked about yet, which is this aspect of meaningful work and meaningful activities, which is your adventure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I, co I coach a number of athletes and, and yet yeah, you can get very regimented in, in your workout plans. And, and what I like to do is just throw in and say, hey, just go out and do what you feel like doing. Don't, don't measure it, don't, just, just go as you feel, just enjoy it. Um, so I, 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 think, uh, that, I think you're doing a good thing. <laughs> Sometimes just leaving the watch at home. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And, and that brings us to play, the notion of play yeah. and playfulness. Yeah. You know, just just go go and do what you fancy doing right now, uh, within limits, obviously. But but that 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 relates to the child within us, where we can just be free and do something for the heck of it because we enjoy it. Yeah. And then yeah. share it with other people as well and tell them about your your crusades, where whatever yeah. they are, because there's a very good chance if somebody can't connect directly with what you're talking about, they know somebody who's done something similar. And, and that's kind of cool. And I, and I think in this world where we are socially distancing, which I think is the complete wrong term, it's physical distancing. That's what prevents this virus from actually, you know, connecting with people. The social distance has to be brought closer together somehow. Okay. So through storytelling, sharing experiences and um, yeah, and, and being curious about things you can actually do and pushing yourself. I love the strength thing, 